this psalm uh, in the events of Numbers chapter 20. And Numbers chapter 20, um, his sister Miriam dies. And then here he is, God's chosen leader to bring the people out. And you'd think they'd be really happy coming out of slavery in Egypt. How quickly we can forget what God has done in our lives to deliver us. And, uh, and God brought them out and, and there's no water and they're grumbling and, and they, they take it out on Moses and Aaron, the, the leaders. And, um, and, and they quarreled and grumbled and it's a mess. And, uh, and God says to Moses, when Moses and Aaron go to God, uh, just speak to the rock and, uh, and water will come out. Speak to the rock. And so Moses, the meekest man on earth, gets really mad with the people and he, and, he, and, and, he, uh, and he says, you're a bunch of rebels. How could you do this? And instead of speaking to the rock, he slams it with his staff twice and, uh, and the water comes out very graciously. But God says, I wanted you to trust me and just speak to the rock. It, it sounds hard, but so often in our own anger, we can try and do what God should be doing and we try and sort things out but anyway so he's he's had the death of his sister he's had he been told by God he's not going to enter into the promised land and then and then Aaron his brother dies to finish the chapter as if it wasn't enough and and that's what the Psalms are about that we can come to God even when we're going through incredible difficulties and prayer always has to begin with God, who, who he is. We're coming to him. And so Moses, coming out of all this, he says, Lord, you've been our refuge. You've been our dwelling place uh, in every generation. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you were God. And sometimes we think, well, yes, uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so God himself dwells within us. But we also need to remember that we dwell in God. Jesus talked about this in John 15, to abide in him, to have your home in God, where God is, to, to actually live with him. And, and what's it like? to have a dwelling place, our refuge in God. I, I want to say to you, I, I believe it's two things in particular that come out here is security and, and acceptance. You know, God made us. He says, uh, you gave birth, God, to the whole creation. You brought the whole creation into being. And, and he knows exactly what we need we don't always think that way but God knows exactly what we need he's made us he's made us for himself and the basis of that is that uh, Moses says he never changes from eternity to eternity he's God and so when God rescued you loved you and rescued you and you came to faith in Jesus he never changes Life will have its ups and downs, just like the psalm starts off with God and then it goes down into what seems God's angry with us and then comes back to delighting in his love each day. God is the same every day for every generation. In Deuteronomy 33, the God of old, the eternal God, is your dwelling place. And in another psalm, Psalm 71 the psalmist says be a rock of refuge for me where I can always go you've been my confidence from my youth and uh, and some of us uh, you know have even turned 90 in recent days and uh, and he says well even in my old age don't discard me and God is 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 the same in our youth in our old age in every situation home 
To be at home with God is where our deepest needs are met. You know, a thousand years are like yesterday to God, like a few hours in the night. And sometimes we can get mixed up with God's timing and our timing. And uh, sometimes, you know, we come in prayer and it's almost like God's already answered and, and we go out and he's provided. And other times God has to say, no, I, I've got something better. I'm just so thankful for some, some of the things I've asked God and, and I realised, whoa, I'm glad he didn't do that. He had something far better. And other times God says, wait. Wait for my perfect timing. A thousand years. In, uh, it's just like uh, God is beyond our sort of very limited time frame and the way we want things to happen when we want them. You know, one of my favourite passages in 2 Corinthians 6, he says, God says, I will dwell and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. I will be a father to you, an eternal father, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. God, your father, cares for you. And uh, let me encourage you. Um, you know, Don mentioned a couple of weeks ago about our, the Bible reading program that's uh, on our um, space site. And... It's just that we've been re started off with Genesis and with Matthew. And God, as you start to read the Bible, God can start to show you more and more what he's like. You know, just I, I read in, in Matthew, um, the hairs of your head are all numbered. That's how intensely God knows you. And when you dwell in him, you're dwelling with someone who knows you so personally and cares for you. And, and wants the best for your life. You can come to God each day and, and say, Lord, you are my acceptance. Jesus is my acceptance before him. But as I said, we can come to him in the midst of hard times. And um, in some ways, as I came to Psalm 90 and uh, got to verses 7 to 11, you know, you, we're consumed by your anger. We're terrified by your wrath. All our days ebb away under your wrath. Who understands the power of your anger? Uh, I said to myself, what did I choose a psalm like this for to uh, preach about? But we've got to see that the gospel deals with God's anger. God is not only a God of love, but God is is a God of holy justice. And uh, the gospel says God doesn't ignore our sin. And uh, where we've, it just pretend as though it doesn't exist. Um, the big word for this morning, we, we've got another 15 words coming up, but the big word for this morning is propitiation. Or uh, in the uh, CSB, it translates it as an atoning sacrifice. And there's a picture there in Hebrews of uh, in the temple, there was the Ark of the Covenant with the lid upon it and the two seraphim looking down. And within the Ark, there was uh, the, te the Ten Commandments, the, the, the commandments that we'd never kept. As we know, Jesus said, it's not just outwardly, but in your heart, you've got to keep his commandments. And, and then there was the rod that, that we've rejected God's authority over our lives. And then there was the manna saying how discontent we are. God provided manna in the wilderness and, and we just wanted more. And, and so God looks down and sees our sin and then the priest would come and sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice and so that God would see not our sin but would see the blood of the sacrifice. And that's what Jesus has done for us. He himself entered into the eternal temple and at once for all laid down his life, gave his blood so that God the Father 
in his righteous anger. See, one of the problems is we have a, a mixed up view because most of our anger is self-centred, wrong anger. Whereas God's anger against sin is absolutely pure and just. And that's why, but that's why we have no hope without Jesus. But Jesus, it says in Romans 3, he presented, God presented not the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of his own son as the propitiation, as the atoning sacrifice. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. He himself is the propitiation for our sin. We had this beautiful passage yesterday at the, at the wedding. I think it was so amazing that was when the tent blew away or the, the umbrella blew away. But we didn't even love God. But we had nothing to offer, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The problem can be that we can come like the psalmist and when things are not working out in our lives, we say, well, I've, I've come to Jesus, but is God angry with me? because of what's happened in my life you know something's you know whether it's a, a sickness or things not working out well in my work or and I can start to fall into the trap of thinking as a Christian that God's angry with me and I want us to remember that in Jesus all his wrath went upon Jesus all his wrath all his anger for my sin that God is no longer angry at me when I am in Christ. God may discipline us. He may have some ways of working out his ways. But you've got to see that God's attitude towards you is of a loving father. And he cares for you. And he's working out in providence all your ways. It took me many years, I think, to understand that. The verse that really helped me was Romans 8 1 there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus why do we condemn ourselves when God himself no longer condemns us God is saying come to him when we come to be in Christ when we become a believer God is no longer angry God is working together all things for our good. And so he comes to the third part of the psalm, teach us to number our days carefully so that we can develop wisdom in our hearts. And, and this isn't about just uh, uh, ticking the box, another day, you know, uh, 70 years less one day or 80 years less one day. Uh, don't get caught up in... Um, this 70 or 80 as though that's uh, like your exact allotted time. God has his perfect time for, for taking us home. But we just, I, I believe what Moses would have us remember is that each day there's so much that is eternal and so much that is temporary. And he's saying, number your days. Don't give your life to what is temporary. It's like the man that Jesus spoke about building all these barns. Um, there's nothing wrong with building barns in itself. You can build buildings all over the place, but it's what are you giving your life to that? Is that what is, consumes you? Is that all you can do? Or are you going to give your life to what's eternal? Jim Elliot was... Um, part of a group of missionaries who went to uh, take the gospel to the Orca Indians in South America and uh, and he and I think it was four others landed in their little plane on a beach by a river in the middle of the jungle and uh, they were all killed and it was his wife and others that uh, eventually took the gospel to that tribe but he had written um, before I think even before he went to South America he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose to give up what you cannot keep in order to gain what you cannot lose so number 
the, the cry is to number our days. Um, I'm not really, uh, I, I admire accountants who are very good at numbers because I'm not very good at numbers. But God says for all of us, whether you're accountants or not, he's asking us, he's calling us to number our days, to ask God to teach us so that each day we can start to invest in what is eternal. Uh, many years ago, uh, a man shared with me uh, three things that are eternal. God himself from eternity to eternity, his word that shall never perish, and people. Heaven or hell, people are eternal. And we, we want to give ourselves in whatever form that takes to God and to his word and, and to people. That's the best investment you can ever make. Let us rejoice, satisfy us in the morning with your faithful loves. And part of numbering each day is to tune in to God. Uh, someone else said to me, have you ever noticed how the orchestra uh, always tunes up before the performance and uh, not afterwards? And uh, what he, he meant by that was, it's good for us as we start each day to tune in to God and to say, Lord, I just want to dwell in you today. I want to walk with you. Now, and, and, and to have a little time in the Word. Now, I know that we've all got different timetables and different programs and, and uh, screaming babies and all sorts of things, um, but some stage, each day, it's good to just tune in to God and say, Lord, I just... Thank you for your goodness towards me. I thank you for your faithfulness. And I want to walk with you, conscious of your presence with you through the day and bring our needs to him. And then finally, the third thing, let your work be seen by your servants and your splendor by their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be on us. Establish for us the work of our hands. Years ago, we had a, a friend who was a missionary in the Ukraine, and I thought of him uh, in recent days with the, uh, the war in Ukraine, and uh, they would just uh, travel the countryside with doing small group Bible studies and one-to-one -one discipleship and uh, helping little groups of believers uh, right across the country. And uh, that, this was the verse that we would pray for them. Let, uh, let your work be seen by your servants. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon them. And, uh, and I don't know how those little groups are going now with the war, but we were praying that God would establish those little groups of believers right across uh, that country. You know, sometimes we, we sort of say, uh, oh, what does God want me to do? And, and I think sometimes a better question is, what is God doing? Where has God been leading me? Uh, otherwise, sometimes we can sort of want to create a work of God instead of allowing God to do his work. That doesn't mean we don't, like Paul says, well, I labour, I'm, I'm striving, but he's striving, he strived according to the work of God within him. And, and so we, we want, above all, to see the beauty of the Lord Jesus in our lives, the beauty, the beauty of the Lord be upon them. It's a lovely prayer to pray for people, not for prosperity, physical prosperity or for everything to work out exactly as, as we think it should, but that in the midst of the mess, that the beauty of the Lord would be there. It's a beauty of holiness. You know, we, we often have a wrong idea of holiness, but really holiness is the life of the Holy Spirit within me. And that life is a beautiful life. It's the when you think of the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and, and patience. 
God brings us into a community and um, Christmas holidays are, are a chance to catch up on reading and um, if you want one of my recommendations, I, I think you ought to um, read a Christian biography every now and then and uh, not that biographies have the same authority as the Bible but it does open up our eyes to see what God is doing in other places and has done and is doing in other places. And uh, these holidays I read Eugene Peterson, uh, Burning in My Bones. He was the fellow who uh, translated or paraphrased the Bible, in the, uh, it, it's called The Message. But he was also a church pastor for many, many years. He thought he was going to be an academic, but uh, God led him to be a pastor. And uh, he, he, the book writes, uh, the church followed no recipe. The people that Eugene initially expected to show up, passionate, mature Christians, eager for God, were few and far between. Instead, there was uh, Gus, a, a long-haul truck driver who adored Elvis Presley, and uh, Dolores, a middle-aged woman who sang Sunday solos with operatic zest, but the higher notes, he says, were like a fingernail down a blackboard. And, uh, and the angry man who just sat there for 27 years, never singing, never talking. And the biology teacher who picked holes in his sermon every week for grammar or pronunciation. And uh, an ex-colonel who just got to church and slept. And a wife in a horrific marriage and a middle-aged man who only knew failure. And uh, Eugene Peterson says, I didn't choose them. I didn't even have the opportunity, in a sense, to choose them. But God chose them, and this is the church. And it's just the same for us today. I, I can remember uh, when I first became a Christian and got involved in a small group, and, and, and I complained to the, um, the leader, I, you know, I've got to sit with uh, engineers and IT people, and uh, this is, you know, people I never would have related to in any way. And yet, God chose us. God brought us together. And one of the things that we long for this year is that as we relate as a community, we remember we didn't choose. We didn't choose God. We didn't choose each other. But God has chosen us. And God's brought us together. And pray that the beauty of the Lord Jesus will be upon each one of our lives as we relate to each other as we, as we care for each other. As, as Paul says, not many of you were wise, powerful. God's chosen what is weak, what is foolish, insignificant, despised, what is viewed as nothing. It's the exact opposite of the whole celebrity culture, uh, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something so that no one can boast in his presence. What a beautiful psalm to take with us we come to see that god is from eternity he never changes he wants to be a father to us to love us to accept us to give us that security and, and to remember when we start to feel that god is angry with us that god has totally dealt with his anger has been totally dealt with by Jesus and that he loves us and cares for us it was in his love that he totally dealt with his anger and you can come to him and see him as an amazing father you can be secure you can be accepted and then these verses uh, let me finish with how the message paraphrases it oh teach us to live well teach us to live wisely and well Come back, God. How long do we have to wait? Surprise us with your love at daybreak and we'll skip and dance all day long. Make up for the bad times with some good times. We've seen enough evil to last a lifetime. Let your servants see what you are best at. What is God best at? The ways you rule and bless your children. And let the loveliness of our God our Lord, our God, rest on us, confirming the work that we do. 
affirm the work that we do. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful that you are our God, that you are an amazing God. From eternity to eternity, you've loved us and that you never change. So we thank you, Father, for your blessings toward us and we, as we come around the table of our Lord, we're just so conscious, Lord, that the Lord Jesus has met our deepest needs. We were alien, alienated from God. We were even hostile to God. And yet, Lord, you loved us and gave your Son to deal with our sin. And we pray that you'd help us this year. Teach us, Lord, to live well, to live wisely and well. So we come now with thankful hearts.